We'll give this about 30 seconds for attendees to pop into our webinar here. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm sure you're all really excited to learn about Proposition 19. We have um, a great agenda for you today with some great experts in this uh, area. Um, so my name is Erin Stumpf and I am your 2021 president elect. Um, with us today, uh, I'm really excited to introduce uh, our county assessor, Christina Wynn. And uh, we also have with us uh, the chief appraiser of the standards division, Linda Cogburn. Uh, so they will be uh, taking us through Proposition 19 today. We also have Carter Nelson on staff and Aaron Teague on staff who will be helping monitor our Q&A. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature. Um, but, you know, just, just to kind of, um, kick things off a little bit, um, I think it's important to understand, um, you know, why Prop 19 uh, became a policy that CAR was really excited to be able to enact. So I'm sure most of you on this webinar are already familiar with our beloved Prop 13, right? Our property tax uh, uh, practice here in California. It was enacted 40-something um, years ago. We just celebrated the 40th anniversary a few years ago. Um, Prop 13, as you guys probably are aware, um, was uh, created as a response to um, solving a problem that a lot of people were being taxed out of their homes. Um, we did not have a uniform property tax system in California prior to the enactment of Prop 13. Different local governments had their own property tax rates, and some of them charged really, really high rates, so high that in some cases, some homeowners actually paid more in property tax than they did for their mortgage payment. So this was problematic. Prop 13 was an answer to that issue. It created a uniform system of property tax throughout California. I'm sure you all know that, you know, it's 1% of the acquisition value and then adjusted for inflation annually. I'll let our assessor get into that a little bit more. Um, but, you know, Prop 19 solves a very important problem that is kind of the spillover effect of of the low property tax base that Prop 13 created. So I'm sure a lot of you um, have clients just like I do. Um, you know, I have a client who um, is a, a widowed homeowner. She's in her 70s. She owns a home in Carmichael. It's two stories, four bedroom, two bath on a quarter acre. Raise the kids, they're grown and gone. Husband has passed away it's really hard for her to maintain. Um, it needs a new roof. She can't do the upkeep. She has trouble getting up and down the stairs, but she can't afford to leave the house because she has a really low property tax bill. And to move out of the county um, closer to her kids who live in Rockland with the grandkids, uh, she would end up having an exorbitant property tax bill, even if she bought a lower price property um, that, that had um, you know, a market rate tax bill. So Prop 19 helps us address that type of issue. Um, it helps uh, seniors, disabled, and victims of disasters transfer their low property tax base outside of the county. They can buy a home of any value and they can do it multiple times. So with that, I'm going to introduce our assessor. Um, again, County Assessor Christina Wynn. She was elected as the assessor in June of 2018 and has served with the Sacramento County Assessor's Office for over 20 years. She's a graduate of UC Davis with a bachelor's degree in agricultural and managerial economics. She has 31 years of experience in the appraisal field, wow, um, holding positions in both the private and public sectors. She's certified by the California State Board of Equalization as an advanced appraiser for property tax purposes. She's a member of the Appraisal Institute and the International Association of Assessing Officers, currently serving as the secretary of the California Assessors Association and is the past president of the Bay Area Assessors Association. She's a Carmichael resident, uh, lives there with her husband, Ed, and her mini Aussie shepherd, Cooper. And in her free time, she enjoys serving the community as a member of the Sir Optimist International of Sacramento North, baking, downhill skiing, hiking, fishing, and spending time with her grown children, Connor and Avery. So I will turn it over to you, Assessor Christina Wynn. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Erin. And thank you to everybody for coming to this uh, presentation today. We're gonna talk about Prop 19. You're gonna know everything about it. You're gonna be able to answer all the questions. So I just really appreciate the invitation, the opportunity to share this information. And before we get started, just to clarify, um, Linda Cogburn uh, from my office, she is here to assist us. She is uh, leading our outreach. She updates our website. She's been helping decipher um, Prop 19. She's been attending the legislation committee meetings with me. So she's here to provide technical assistance and help us answer questions. And I thank Linda for, for being here today. So I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna get started. Okay. Okay. So the voters um, back in November voted in Proposition 19. And with this, we have some very significant changes to property tax rules for intercounty and inheritance transfer. Some have said these changes are the most significant since Prop 13 was adopted uh, 42 years ago now. T time's really gone by. So as we briefly touched on already, um, we have to think about the basis of what, what our taxation system is and Prop 13 really is that basis. And what happens is we're limiting the annual increases in the assessed value to a maximum of 2%, except when there's a cha change in ownership or new construction. So basically this is holding those assessed values down so that people aren't, don't see large increases in any one year. And whenever the assessed value increases, you're also seeing a tax increase. So these, this makes your annual taxes very predictable and for most people affordable. So since Prop 13 was adopted um, over the years, um, several propositions have been voted in that have excluded certain transfers of ownership from reassessment under Prop 13. And you're probably very familiar with these. Um, we're looking at you know, Propositions 58 and 193, which before Prop 19 were the laws that were enacted um, to exclude the transfers between parents and child and grandparents and grandchildren. And then 60 and 90, those are the 55 plus years uh, for the those folks, the seniors, that was the um, the rules that let them transfer their base to another property in, in the county or into another county, if that county would adopt the ordinance that had to be locally adopted by the Board of Supervisors. I think there's about 12 counties that had adopted those provisions. And then, of course, 110, which addresses the situation for those severely disabled and enables them to transfer their base. So we're, with Prop 19, now we've expanded certain transfer benefits. And so homeowners who are 55 or older or who are severely disabled or victims of a governor declared disaster wishing to transfer their base, really their tax benefits to another home in California now have several more options to do so. So with Prop 19, there's no value limit. So if you transfer your base to another home and the, the value is higher, then um, the, you can still do it. You just have to, we'll meet, there'll be an adjustment and you'll be paying on that difference. So before the requirements were, you had to purchase of equal value or less. And now that requirement is gone. So you can pretty much purchase what you want. And there's no location limit. So you can move to any county that you want. And it doesn't require any kind of an ordinance, a local ordinance for you to do that. And then also the ability to, to do this more than one time. So under the prior rules, um, you could only do this one time, but now you can transfer your base up to three times. If you are a victim of a governor declared disaster, though, there is no limit at all. And But of course, I would never want, hopefully nobody would go through some kind of disaster um, for that many times. That would be terrible. So I, I've created an example to, to, so we can take a look at how this really works. So this is a base year transfer benefits example. So in this example, the original property sells for $500,000 and the replacement um, is purchased for $700,000.
that base share value or the tax base of the original property is 250,000. So how, how are we gonna figure out what the new base will be of that replacement property? So we take the um, 250,000 original and then we compare the sale price of the original and the replacement. And since the replacement costs more, we're gonna add that difference. So 700,000 minus 500,000 is 200,000. We add those together, we get 450,000. So you can kind of take a look and see what that tax savings would be. So taxes on 700,000 in Sacramento County, it's approximately $8,400 a year, but under 450,000, it's significantly less at $5,400 a year. So you're saving about $3,000 a year under this benefit. Now on the flip side, we have some elimination and reduction of inheritance benefits. So under Prop 19, and it's now in place because this was um, according, according to the language, this portion of Prop 19 went into effect on February 16th. So we are now operating um, under these rules for transactions that happen on that date and later. So now um, children and grandchildren who inherit their parents or grandparents' principal residence and if they choose not to make the home their principal residence, will now have the property reassessed. They will no longer qualify for the benefit. There is one exception, and that is for the family farm. So um, heirs of family farms don't have to live on the farm to get this benefit uh, because a lot of times family farms don't have a house to live in, so they're excluded. But it, regardless, if you are inheriting a property that does have a home and you're gonna have to make it your primary residence, you have to do so within one year of transfer of ownership. So if you, um, that means you have to get your homeowner's exemption or your disabled veteran's exemption within that time frame to qualify. And now um, there's a maximum total benefit of the inherited principal residence or family farm of $1 million. So before we didn't have that maximum, but now, we do so um, that we will have to be examining the transactions to be sure we're within those million dollar limits. Also, um, under the prior rules, you could transfer um, property assessed values of other properties, properties other than your principal residence of up to a million dollars. So that would be like a vacation home, residential rental or commercial property. So in the pro under the prior rules, you could make those transfers in addition to the principal residence. So what does it mean if we're going to reset assessed value to market and what kind of impact could this have? And so this, you know, we're looking really talking here about the inheritance properties. So let's say a, a, a home has been in the family for a long time. Um, it has a current assessed value of 50,000. It likely has been in the property prior to Prop 13. And in Sacramento, they would be paying a tax bill of approximately $600. But if someone in the family uh, inherits this property, but they can't make it their primary residence, then it will be reassessed to market, let's say at about 750,000. And so we're looking at about a $9,000 tax bill um, in that case. So this is a significant tax increase. It may impact the feasibility of continued ownership of inherited family properties It, you know, it remains to be seen the full impact, but that's really what we're looking at. So here's an example of how we will be calculating uh, parent to child transactions under Proposition 19. So we take a look at the value of the principal residence at the time of inheritance. So let's say in this example, the home is worth 750,000. It has an existing tax base of 300,000 under the parents. So we have to do a value test. So we look at the 300,000 and we add 1 million, which is the limit. And that's, so that equates to 1.3 million, which is more than the uh, fair market value of the home of 750,000. In that case, they can keep the, in, the tax base intact. There's no change and so, because they didn't exceed the million dollar limit. So the new base year value of their principal residence is 300,000. That's a tax savings of about $5,400 a year. This is the same tax savings they would get under the prior 
um, Prop 58 rules. The only difference now is this person who inherited this property must maintain the property as their principal residence into perpetuity to retain the tax savings. Lost my little mouse there. <laughs> okay. So here's another example. Um, we've got full cash value of a principal residence at inheritance of 1.5 million factored base share value, the original tax base under the parents of 250,000. So we're gonna do the value test. We're gonna add $1 million to that 250,000. That equals 1.25 million, which is less than the full cash value at time of inheritance. Therefore, we're gonna have an adjustment. And how we do that is we take the full the, the market value minus um, the 1.25 million and add the tax base. So we're going to get to 500,000. So that will be the new tax base under the new rules. So they can still they can still um, take advantage of the benefit. They just have to pay for the difference. They're still going to get a tax savings of about six thousand dollars. But keep in mind that under the prior rules, um, without the million dollar benefit, their tax savings would be about twelve thousand because they would have maintained the entire two hundred fifty thousand dollar tax base without adjustment. Um, and once again, in this case, they still have to maintain the property as the principal residence um, into perpetuity to maintain the benefit. So one of the things that is important to understand is um, many, many people have their properties in trust. They've set up their trusts, um, certain uh, rules of inheritance. And um, now that we have these changes for any transactions that occur occurring after February uh, 15th could be impacted. Their trust situation could be impacted. So really what we're recommending is people seek out their um, accountants, financial planners <laughs> to discuss the impacts of this change and how they may want to restructure um, their trusts or not. And um, it's not something that actions shouldn't be taken or, you know, irrationally or quickly. This really needs to be um, thought through very carefully because there are um, other co consequences from a tax perspective and really um, professionals should be consulted. So timing. So we, um, now that enough time has passed since we first started talking about uh, Prop 19 after it was implemented, the first portion has kicked in now. So really what we're looking at is transactions occurring before and after this date. So if you have transactions occurring prior to this February 16th, then those qualify under the old inheritance rules under Prop 58. Anything that transacts February 16th or later would then fall under these new rules. And so this is not about when they file for the benefit. This is about when the, the interest of the property transfers. So um, a couple of things to keep in mind, there were a lot of questions about dates because these dates fell on a county holiday and the Friday before was also a county holiday. So getting documents recorded was a little bit of a challenge. So really we're looking at when transactions were signed. So when were the documents signed? Not necessarily when it was recorded uh, because there could have been some delay in getting the document recorded. So typically we're looking at recording dates, but in this case, because of the situation, we're gonna be looking at the dates documents were signed. Now, when it comes to transfers due to a death of a parent or grandparent, there's nothing that can be done about that. Those dates are set. Um, the government code doesn't extend any days um, for death because it's really designed to accommodate for um, paperwork requirements and government requirements to file a document by a certain day. So if there's been a transfer of ownership due to death, the 15th is still going to be that trigger date. And so we'll be having to examine the documents very closely to be sure we're getting the dates correct. I also wanted to mention that um, those uh, you know, now that the date is kind of passed, it's maybe a little less imperative, but there were a, 
a lot of people who were trying to do transactions, you know, prior to this date. And one of the things is, like I said before, we really recommended people consult their their um, financial advisors because there can be other tax consequences. For instance, if you transfer property to someone, there could be a gift tax consequence. So really, we we really advise people to closely examine these um, situations before they act. And also know that if you transfer your base to your children, it's not available to you anymore to transfer to another property in the state. So there's a lot of considerations to keep in mind. Okay, so the next portion of Prop 19 is the timing of the base year value transfer portion. And that date is still yet to come. It's coming quickly though. So we're looking at a date really of April 1. So these transactions, um, anything that's happening prior to April 1, um, if both transactions happen prior to April 1st, they, they don't qualify under Prop 19. But if one of the two transactions happens April 1st or later, they would qualify as long as they're within the two-year time limit. So um, this question has come up a lot. Is there a special order? And the answer is no, they can occur in any order. You can sell, uh, buy, buy your replacement first, sell the original later. It's the second transaction that really triggers the ability to transfer the base. So either one or, or both transactions have to occur April 1st or later. And I'll, I'll also remind the two years. So the time frame, and we're gonna go over this a little more, is you have the two transactions can't be more than two years apart. Family farms. So um, family farms are a special aspect of Proposition 19. They're also one of the more complicated and potentially controversial aspects of Proposition 19. And the um, they still, are able to um, can still transfer the base to your children and you have a million dollar benefit limit, same as the principal residence, but of course you don't have to make it your, your principal residence in order to obtain and keep the benefit. The thing to note about family farm transactions is they must generally meet the same conditions as parent child, grandparent, grandchild, principal residence transactions in that the transaction must be between individuals and not legal entities. Okay, so we're gonna, um, we're getting to the Q&A point and I know we talked to Aaron about possibly um, looking at the chat to see if there were questions before we got into Q&A. Yeah, thank um, you. It looks like we do have a few questions and Carter will uh, read those off. Yes, we definitely have a few. So um, let's start with, will the million dollar limit be adjusted annually for inflation? I believe the answer to that is yes. And Linda, you can confirm, I believe they're all, set, they, they do have, it is all set to adjust. Yes, Christina, the date for that is um, February 16th, 2023 will be the first adjustment. And then it'll be annually from then on. Got it. Thank you. Um, so how does this affect family trust if the property remains in the family trust? So, so what we have to remember is Prop 19 doesn't change the way trusts act or what they do, right? It only changes when an event, occur, when a benefit, beneficial interest occurs, what happens after that? So really, if you have something in a trust um, that's already uh, transferred beneficial interest prior to the implementation here, you're under the old rules. So really, we look through the trust to see who's getting the, <clears throat> excuse me, who's getting the beneficial interest and when. So before we decide, we look at the trust when when did the beneficial interest transfer and who got it and, and did they qualify and under what set of rules based on the timing? Linda, is there more um, that you wanna to add to what I said? Um, not at this time, unless someone has a question about it. Okay. I think that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> if the heir sells in 20 years, will they have to pay the tax owed originally? No, as long as they maintain the property as their principal residence, 
then they would, if they sell the property, then it just, it will be reassessed to the new buyer. But if they, if they inherit the property and they don't make it their primary residence, of course, it's going to get reassessed. If they inherit the property, live in it for a while, then move out, once they move out, it will be reassessed and the, the value at the time that they inherited the property, that market value, we'll have to keep that in our records, would be reinstated, but factored up to that date at a time when they no longer live there. Got it. So our next question you kind of answered, which is what happens if you, as a beneficiary, do move into the house? How long are you supposed to, how long must you keep it before you sell it? But the, it sounds like the answer is as soon as you sell it, it gets reassessed. Yes, and you have one year. Once you um, inherit the property, you have one year to make it your principal residence in order, if you don't do that within the one year, you will not qualify for the benefit. Got it. Um, so for a trust, um, would it be the date of death of a parent or when the distribution to the child is completed? So the date of death, this is a very common question. The date of death is always the date of a transfer of beneficial interest because persons who are deceased cannot hold interest of property. And so um, it will be the as of the date of death. But what happens is it's, it's held uh, until the property is distributed. So we, <laughs> we put it in the, the estate of until the, uh, such time as we know who the next um, owner is, but it will be reassessed as of the date of death. And then if the heirs do qualify for a benefit, then that benefit gets applied. Got it. Um, so we had someone wondering, how do you find the base value of the original? Like on the tax bill, could you guide us to where you find that information? So that's a really good question. And it's not available on the tax bill. You'll have to call the assessor's office and they will give it to you. Got it. Um, all right. Is there any ability to increase the 1 million in the future, allowing for market increase? Or do we know that um, the only way that that could be, that could take place was if there was a, a new ballot measure, because what we have to keep in mind is with this ballot measure, it altered the constitution. And so now future changes like the one that you're asking about would then have to require another voter approved measure. So it can't just be a regulation. So it would have to be voter approved. Okay, that makes sense. So um, this one's interesting. Do all counties have the same legal understanding of the two parts, the one part prior to April 1st and the other part following? Yes. Yeah, so we have, the assessors have spent quite a bit of time meeting and talking about implementation of Prop 19. We have um, a, basically a document that we've issued amongst ourselves in agreement to implement the rules in this, a similar fashion. If you go to most of the websites, you'll see a lot of the similar same documents from the Board of Equalization and other documents that have been produced um, since this Prop 19 was passed. So there is general agreement amongst assessors that it applies the same in all counties. All right, well, that's good for everybody. Um, what would the difference be if the trust is a living trust versus a non-revocable -re trust? So uh, oftentimes an irrevocable trust causes an immediate action because once it's, as soon as it's irrevocable, generally an interest is transferring, right? It, it becomes at that moment, you can't change it. So there could be um, an action that occurs where someone has received an interest of property due to an irrevocable trust that then be, could trigger an accessible event. A living trust is different because it, and the way I understand living trusts is that it doesn't, an action doesn't happen until, until something later, like somebody dies later. So it's not immediately enacting a, a transfer of interest. And Linda, you can definitely add to this one if you have more input. Well, remember that it, it comes down to the beneficial use. So, you know, when a, a trust becomes irrevocable, the beneficiaries have the beneficial use of the property at that time. When you have a living trust, if the trusters 
still have full beneficial use of the property, the right to refinance and everything else that comes with ownership, then there's not a transfer. So it's when it becomes irrevocable and the, now the, the beneficiary, normally the children, can do the refinancing or can um, make sell the property. Up until that point, until it becomes irrevocable, the beneficiary can't sell that property. So they don't have full beneficial rights to it. I hope that made sense. I think so. Thank you for that extra explanation. Um, so we had another quick, uh, this one's pretty quick, I think. Is base value the assessed value at the time of death and or is it the value at original purchase? So yeah, so that's a great question. So really what we're talking about at the time of death is what what's the term is factored base value. So it's that original base value when that person acquired the property, then factored up that 2% we talked about in the beginning, that Prop 13 mandates, that 2% gets added onto the assessed value every year. So for all of the time they owned it, the inflation factor is applied up until the time they don't own it. So that's what we mean by factored. So it really is that original base value, but adjusted for inflation over the time of ownership. Got it. Um, which is the governing law, Prop 13 or Prop 19, um, regarding occupancy for the benefit if the date of death was prior to February of 2021, but the distribution happens after 2021? It will be Prop 13. Uh, it'll actually be 58. Um, it will fall under the rules of the prior, uh, the pre-Prop 19 rules because the death is the date the interest transferred the beneficial interest, right? Unless it had already transferred prior to that. But even if it had, that would still be under the old, old rules. So the data distribution doesn't impact it from the aspect of where, where will it qualify? It will qualify based on the date the person passed away. And if that's prior to February 16th, then it's under the old rules, the more permissive rules. Got it. So does the new primary need to be a new purchase or can it be the taxpayer moves into a second home and transfer their property tax basis? Ooh, that's a really good question. That's a new one. Um, can you repeat that question? Oh please? my goodness. I know the, the wording is a little tricky. I, I think I'm under, so does the new primary need to be a new purchase or can it be the taxpayer moves into a second home and transfers their property tax basis? I think it has to be a new purchase. Okay. But this is, <laughs> I love, we got one that we have to, I like it when we get stuck. I, because, you, yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to well, jump because in. I know in the state of Florida, the state of Florida, actually, they're, they're, property tax basis model incorporates a change where you actually can transfer to an existing property. So I'm not sure if maybe he's, you know, thinking about that law and wondering if it extrapolates here, but the state of Florida allows that in their property tax basis portability. I don't think it would be allowable because there actually has to be an event to be excluded and there really isn't one. There really is no change in ownership. You already own it. So I... You know, I don't know, Linda, you can give your opinion on this, but I'm thinking this one wouldn't qualify. Okay, for the base year value transfer, no. But if they're talking about parent-child transfer, let's say, for instance, and a parent, you know, that transfers their principal place of residence to a child and then moves into a property that already they already own and they establish residency there, and then they want to transfer that base year value to a different child, if that's what they're referring to, that they can do that, but not on a base year value transfer. You have, it has to be a purchase. It clearly states it, yeah. that it has to be a purchase or, and a sale. And, and, and just to clarify, if you transfer your base year value to a child, you cannot transfer it to another property either. Okay, you only get to transfer once. You either give it to your children or you take it with you to a new property. You can't do both, if that makes sense. Thanks, Linda. Yep, that was helpful. Thank you both for the 
answering the challenging question. So um, we have a couple more. Um, do all heirs have to live in the property within one year? or just one of the children, grandchildren, or whoever is inheriting the property um, in order to get that property tax base transfer? This is really interesting question that's been debated. And really what we've come up with is only one heir has to make the property their principal residence. And they can actually change out which one of the qualifying heirs has the property as their principal over time. So one can live there for a while, then one of the other ones can move in and live there for a while, but each time it changes, each time the, where there's a new heir living there, they have to go, they have to, they're gonna have to file a document with us to indicate that change has taken place. So only one at a time, and there is the ability for them to switch out who's living there, as long as one of the qualified heirs is making it their principal residence. All right. Um, we were hoping to get some, someone wanted clarification. I, I think we touched on this, but just one more time. When you transfer the value for 55 and older, is it the original assessed value or the current assessed value when sold? Current assessed when sold. All right. We got that clarified. Um, someone wanted to um, review the transfer of the tax base on the first slide. And I'll let everyone know I, I'm answering in the, the chat, but um, I will be happily emailing Christina's presentation. She's been kind enough to share that with us. And I think it's a great resource. And then we'll also, I think, um, find a way to get that up on our, our website so that everybody has easy access to that. Um, so that yes, definitely. You have, you have questions. <laughs> And I will be providing um, information at the end. I do have a slide that has a way for you all to contact my staff with questions about Prop 19. And so I, you know, if you have something that pops up later, you can always send an email into my office and ask the, the questions and get an answer. Right, we have one or two specific questions that I, I figure would be more useful um, reaching out to your staff for their um, individual questions. Okay. Um, that are a little more specific. Um, but we do have, it looks like one or two more. Um, if a spouse dies, is the base value adjusted? And how does this affect the transfer value? So spouses are, have automatic exclusion from reassessment. So if you have two spouses, they own the property together, one passes away, there is no reassessment. It's automatically excluded. That's part of Prop 13. Um, and then we had a question, um, was the inheritance portion in the ballot measure? And yes, unfortunately, it had a very small, gosh, if, I mean, we've heard from the public that they weren't really aware of that portion, and it really didn't seem to be addressed very thoroughly. So um, uh, it seems like, unfortunately, uh, not much attention was given to that portion. Um, but I guess if you read through the whole proposed language, you would have seen it, but in the ballot measure description, I don't think it was really addressed to its um, nece the necessary extent that it should have been. And I, I think it's worth noting just to, just to piggyback um, our assessor's comments on that. Um, this provision, even though it ultimately got included in Proposition 19, likely was going to come up as a standalone issue. Um, there was a Senate constitutional amendment that had already been making its way through the Senate. Uh, it was Senate Constitutional Amendment 3 by uh, Senator Hill. Um, it was introduced in the 2019-2020 session, and it passed through um, several committees um, and then actually was put on hold um, because some of its provisions got included in Proposition 19. Um, the Legislative Analyst Office in 2017 issued a very detailed report encouraging the legislature to rethink this inheritance tax exclusion. Um, and, you know, CAR and uh, Assemblymember Mullen, who authored Assembly Constitution Amendment 11, which became Prop 19, I think very wisely included this in there. Uh, mostly because it actually preserved the inheritance tax exclusion up to a million dollars because there was this threat of it being taken away completely. So just to shed a little bit of light on that, I think it's really important. I know a lot of people are upset that they, they, there's this perception that, you know, oh my gosh, the inheritance tax exclusion was taken away. 
Um, we actually, CAR worked very hard to preserve that um, for our, um, you know, property owners, homeowners, um, because it was likely going to be taken away under some kind of a separate effort, and it, that effort was already underway. So just just to shed some light on that and and help people understand that yes, this <laughs> this isn't the ideal situation, but we did really good things to preserve it. Right. Yeah, and I think I can add a little bit on to that as well because when it was being um, explained to assessors, there was the concern about the cost. And so one portion has a, a cost to it and the other is probably a revenue generator. And so between the two, it, the intent is, is to have less impact on the potential revenue from property tax. There is requirements for us to report out um, every year the benefits received and those that are lost. And the CDTFA will do an accounting of that. And apparently counties could be um, reimbursed um, revenue losses if there are any, um, if there's funds available in the funds that they're putting together for all of this. So, you know, it's very, um, property taxation is very complex on that side. Of course, assessors don't get involved in necessarily that part of it, but it appeared that there, you know, one of the reasons why it was acceptable was the fact that it could get paid for, whereas um, on its own, if you just took the base year transfer, then it may not have been um, acceptable from the aspect of loss of revenue. So, um, you know, unfortunately it, it has winners and losers and that makes it really difficult you know, when you're talking to taxpayers because you have some that are just thrilled and then some that are just very upset. And so, you know, you get, it's like, you don't know what to do about it because you don't, you don't want to trample on anyone's happiness, but at the same time, be sympathetic for people that aren't going to be able to transfer their family properties. Right. Um, I believe we have a couple more questions. <laughs> Sorry, they keep coming in. Um, when a child claims the parent home is a primary residence, but then moves out years later, but retains ownership, say to rent it out or something, um, is the transferred base property tax value retained? Wait, can you say that again? So the child, the child inherits the home, they move in as a primary residence, but say in a couple of years, they, um, they move out, but they keep the residence, um, is the transferred base property tax value retained? So in the parent to child transfer, the, what it is, is that at the time they inherited and qualified for the benefit, they just retain the parent's tax base. And if they live in the property, then that will continue on. However, if they move out and rent, start renting it, then the property tax base will be changed. And what we do is we look back to the time they inherited it. At that time, we did a market value analysis because of the million dollar limit and we keep that information handy. And so if somebody moves out, we just take that value um, and it gets factored just like any other Prop 13, the 2% a year up until the time that they moved out. So it will be an adjusted. So it will be that market value as of the time they inherited it, just did it up for time. I think we have about 15 minutes left um, in our session today. So I think, um, thank you everyone for your thoughtful questions. Um, I know our assessor has some um, commonly asked questions that she'd like to take us through as we wrap this up. Um, so assessor, if, um, there are some topics here that maybe didn't get covered in the Q&A that you'd like to take us through, that would be great. And we'll, we'll wind this up on time in about 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah, there's definitely some we've covered. Um, I wanna just, under this first question, um, people asking are asking on what date is the value of the original and replacement primary residence um, determined for purposes of calculating the trans verbal taxable value. And so we're really looking at the acquisition dates and the sale dates. And that could, those could be two years apart. And so you could have um, possibly changes due to the 2% inflation factor applied. Um, so just 
that is, um, I, th I think that might come up as a question because under the old rules, there was more, um, a little more flexibility in determining the differences in the values because of the time frame change. So, um, but under Prop 19, there, none of that is included and it's just what was the assessed value at the time of the transactions. Um, we've covered this one and this one, as well as that. Um, okay. So this is a question where they're asking about extension of the two year time frame because of COVID and delays and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, the two year time frame is a constitutional requirement now um, because it was part of Prop 19. And if there's gonna be any change to that, it's gonna require um, a new ballot measure. This is a question about the order of the transactions, which I think is really important to cover again. Um, they're asking about whether they can purchase their Sacramento area home first and then sell their Dublin home after the Sacramento area home closes escrow. And the answer is yes. The only concern here is timing. Um, if you purchase the Sacramento home first, the sale of the Dublin home must be completed April 1st, 2021 or later. This is a good question. It talks about, this is really about the filing and the paperwork. Um, so this person inherited a property and the grant deed was recorded a couple months ago. Are there, are there any additional documents that need to be submitted or is the recording of the grant deed enough to avoid the new Prop 19 regulations? Well, the answer is you must file for the parent to child exclusion directly with the assessor of the county where the property is located to receive the benefit. It is not automatic. Although the documents included as part of the closing, like the, um, the PCOR, the Preliminary Change in Ownership Report, there's a box there, a couple boxes where they can check and we read those. And when people um, say this is parent to child, we'll send them the information in the forms, but they still have to file. So um, it's not an automatic. Uh, this is one where we're talking about the potential problem with the two year limit really where um, they sold their primary residence in June of 2019 and they've been postponing purchasing the replacement. Um, but really, you know, as long as they purchase it April one or later, <laughs> they'll qualify. Um, however, it must be before June of 2021 to keep it within the two year limit. So those two year limits, it seems like a lot of time, but sometimes it makes it kind of tight. This is really, we've really covered this, this is where we talk about adding to the base when you, when you buy up. And this is really a question about what happens now to your rental properties, vacation homes or commercial properties. And of course they no longer qualify under the parent to child, uh, the old Prop 58 rules. And so they would be reassessed upon inheritance. This is really talking, we've covered trust quite a bit. And so this is really repetitive. Um, I, I just wanna make a point that Prop 19 can affect properties in multiple counties and some implementation aspects still require clarification. There could be some regulations coming with legislation that's out there now. But really, I recommend that people contact the assessor in the county where they'll be applying for the tax benefit to get official responses to any unique situations. Um, complex situations under the new rules can take more time to vet out. And I really recommend people um, reach out as soon as possible to figure out how these will be handled. And then of course, if you've got any questions about Prop 19, we set up a special email to receive your questions and respond, prop19 at sackcounty.net. You can talk to our staff. Um, our phone, our, our uh, call center is open every day, Monday through Friday. Our public lobby is only open by appointments right now. So if an appointment needs to be made, they can call that phone number and make an appointment. And our website has a ton of information. We're updating it constantly as new information is released. And of course, you can always contact me directly um, if I can be of assistance. 
that's really the end of my presentation. And for any more questions you might have or. Does, does Cooper always dress up uh, for the occasion <laughs> like this? Well, you know, I, he like, I have around the holidays and stuff. I might find something a little fun for him and he's a good sport, but yeah, he, <laughs> he doesn't really like wearing stuff on his head though. So that's the only thing. <laughs> well, I can't, I can't say I blame him for that. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, this was really, really great. I know, um, you know, there's there's a lot of questions surrounding Prop 19. I know um, uh, Christina Wynn and Linda Cogburn did a great job addressing um, all of the questions that we had. I know that there are probably more. Um, thank you so much for offering your contact information for our members to reach out to you and your staff in the future with questions. And I also want to just reiterate, you know, one of the themes here too is that, you know, doing property transfers can trigger other issues. We should, as realtors, should never be giving our clients tax or legal advice. We really need to refer them to the assessor's office, to their staff for these types of questions, to CPAs, to attorneys. You know, we really should not be providing our clients any of this type of information directly. Um, it's so important that they get expert advice because the ramifications of their actions regarding property transfer, property tax, and all those things, I mean, they're far reaching and far and wide. So we really, um, you know, as realtors should not be giving our clients <laughs> answers to these questions. We should be sending them to the experts to get their questions answered. Um, so anyway, I, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. You're, you're, you're such a, an asset to our county and to a, a great help to our association um, with, with things like this. So we, we really um, appreciate your time today. Thank you, Erin. It's just been a pleasure. I hope I've been helpful. I'd be happy to come back and um, you know talk about any other questions or information you might want to know about. And once again, please reach out to us, anybody if they have any questions or concerns about Prop 19, we'll see what we can do to help. Great, thank you for that. And thank you, Linda and Carter and Aaron on staff. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. I'm sure it's gonna be a busy one for all of you. The weather's beautiful. So uh, have a good one and we will see you uh, in another month or two with another uh, helpful topic to you know, help navigate whatever the current issues look like. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care.